за. Good Monday morning to you. I'm Mike Niano, pastor of the Blue Point Bible Church and director of the Power of Preterism Network. It's my privilege to be here uh, live with you for the Preterist Power Hour. This is our second week doing our daily program. Again, uh, myself and my co-host, Edward Howell, who is here with us in our session. However, we'll join at a, a later moment. Uh, I'm excited to move in on today's program. Uh, what I'd like to do is just offer up a short review of some things that we had previously talked about. And then I'll lean us in on a top of uh, discussion regarding uh, a dialogue that I had with a man named Sean Griffin, uh, who leads a ministry called Kingdom in Context on YouTube. Uh, I had a talk with him on Friday night, and uh, we went for about two and a, two and a half hours. And I'd like to share some of my thoughts post dialogue, and maybe mark out some things that uh, we did not get to properly, or in my estimation, clearly mark out during that uh, dialogue. So uh, before I go any further, what I'd like to do is go ahead and open us in a word of prayer, and then I'll go ahead and uh, jump in with a bit of review, and then lean us right into the topic of that, dial that dialogue. Mighty God, we do thank you for the opportunity to gather here on social media, that we have an opportunity to fellowship beyond uh, being in person, and that we might lean in on uh, clarity, healing, and strategy, Lord, in regards to the power of preterism. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the fulfilled truth that you have made known to us. We thank you that uh, we have this privilege to seek, search, study, and prove before us. And of course, we thank you for the fellowship of believers where we can seek to uh, sharpen one another as iron sharpens iron and that we can encourage one another in study and know that it, the prayer was not, Lord, my father, but our father, so that we would find value in our our corporate identity as a people together. May we grow together, Lord, and glorify you in our time together today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So we had covered the mark of the beast for a whole week last week, and I believe that we did a very sufficient job of covering the topic. Uh, this past weekend, I was interested to hear what Edward had to say, so hopefully when he joins us uh, on the program live here that he'll share some thoughts with us regarding uh, this point that Throughout the weekend, uh, being that we did five days of talking about the mark of the beast and we have relationships outside of this session here, uh, obviously people were asking us questions, you know, and talking about it. I know I had quite a few people come up to me or mention the mark of the beast to me in dialogue, and I had the opportunity to think back to everything that we covered in five days. Also, obviously, I've put together a lot of our resources, so I'm familiar with the different blogs and sermons that are there in the, on the uh, Power of Preterism WordPress site. And uh, so every time somebody asks me a question, my goal is to make the most concise, uh, and hopefully that's all of our goal. Hopefully we share the desire to bring clarity to people. And my goal is usually to make the most concise explanation that I can. And uh, as I've mentioned a couple of times to people that the first thing we need to do is we need to take all the information in and then breathe. It's Monday morning, let's breathe together. <laughs> so uh, again, you know, we take in the information and then we think, okay, so what was important in our talking about the mark of the beast? And the first thing is obviously the sea beast, right? Revelation 13 uh, is where we begin to hear this, this talk about the beasts in the book of Revelation. And uh, obviously we talked about Daniel and understanding prophetic language and how that applies to kingdoms, beast language and horns to rulers and different things like that. Hopefully you've taken in that information. Now, when we get to Revelation 13, we have all that information in our head and we can apply it. And we've talked about Mystery Babylon and the context of first century and how time texts point out that uh, these things are in the first century. Again, this is the Preterist Power Hour, so we're not dealing with the host of different views that people want to put upon eschatology. We're going to show you the power of preterism and how that brings clarity to the things we're reading in scripture. So uh, if you have an issue with preterism, which again, we're going to lean in on a bit here in a moment, my, Sean with, my discussion with Sean Griffin uh, talks about those that would have issues with preterism uh, and We'll lean in on that topic here in a moment. However, for those of us that do understand time texts, do understand the context of the first century and Revelation finding its fulfillment in the first century, what we can do is we could say the first beast was a beast of the nations, of the sea. Again, noting our understanding of prophetic language. So now that we know that, what we need to do is lean in on the first century and ask ourselves, what rulership 
uh, of the Gentiles was being highlighted in the first century. It doesn't take us very far to understand it was the Romans. Uh, then uh, when we look at the land beast, uh, we say what people in the land, the land of Canaan, uh, had some sort of kingdom or some sort of rulership. And then we look at the Jewish system. We look at, we don't need to isolate. So what we can do is say the high priest, as Holger Neubauer brought before us, uh, we can say uh, the different uh, zealots and warriors and, and, and different, uh, the Sicarii and, and different details that we find in the Roman Jewish war. Uh, we can mark them out together as the kingdom in the land, so to speak. Then, uh, and it's only then when we figure out how we're putting those beasts together that we can start discussion about horns and marks. Again, because the horns and the marks are a part of the beast systems that we're seeing uh, take place there. So really what you just need to do is lean in on a bit of history and kind of put that picture together. Now that you've put that picture together, the next question is, now what? Now that you know the mark of the beast was this uh, historical scene in the book of Revelation uh, that you know obviously accomplished the consummation of the kingdom of God, and now what do you do with this information? You can relax in it. You can say, this is great that I know what the book of Revelation is leaning toward. You, you can know that we're not moving toward the end times. You can maybe help your friends in discussion about the mark of the beast. Uh, you know, there's so many great things that you can do with it. Uh, so hopefully we've given you that information and we've put that before you. Uh, if you're waiting for the mark of the beast, there's a bunch of other information and things you need to be considering. And you need to really lean in on studying the Bible so that you would know what Christ had commanded you to do. A matter of fact, that actually brings me to our discussion uh, with Sean Griffin, because that was one of my issues that I leaned in on regarding futurism was that the, the problem, the biggest distinction I have with the futurist is that they don't seem to understand not only what time we're in, but what we need to be doing. Not only what we need to be doing in the time that I know we're in, but they don't seem to know what they're supposed to be doing in the time that they think we're in. And that's where things get confusing. That's why when I say the power of preterism, for me, what comes to mind is clarity, healing, and strategy. The clarity is that we use audience relevance to read our Bible. The healing is that now I, I actually can read my Bible and gain understanding as to what God wants me to do, what it means to be in the kingdom of God, what the kingdom of God is. Uh, and then after that, hopefully you have this desire to say, how can I help others understand this? How can I advance this truth. And that's what we refer to as strategy. So uh, I talked a bit about that on the program there with uh, Sean Griffin. I was able to explain a bit about the power of preterism and uh, why I believe in preterism and uh, things like that. So uh, I'm excited for that. Uh, Edward, I see you're here with us. I want to go ahead and uh, give you opportunity to say hello and let me know if you're able to uh, fully dialogue with us now at this point. Yes. Hello. Yes, I am. I am. Uh... I had to go through four different departments. You know, they they called me like three minutes prior to going on air, you okay. know, but uh, they, I got the issue remedied and I should be refunded within uh, five to seven business days. So okay, cool. I heard, yeah. your, I think I heard my voice when you called in. So are you uh, clued into what I was saying or do you want me to kind of outline and bring you up to speed with uh, some of the things I just mentioned? If it's not an issue. All right, that's cool. Uh, so what I had done was I marked out the mark of the beast, and I'm interested here. I'm going to give you a moment to share with us uh, some of your thoughts in regards to the mark of the beast. And my reason for bringing it up was throughout the weekend, I had many people that listened to the program, either through so social media or in person, that came up to me and said, yeah, can you real quickly give me an outline of the mark of the beast? And obviously, you know, you're walking through a restaurant, you don't have time to break out your Bible and go through, through an exegesis of Revelation 13 through 19. Uh, however, uh, what I tried to do for some people was give them quick outlines of things that we had said. So I was curious, uh, and I mentioned some of that here before, I'd be curious to hear what, what your experience was coming out of a week of talking about the mark of the beast. So that's the first thing. And then the second thing was I was about to lean in on uh, my thoughts regarding the discussion with Sean Griffin. Okay. So first, Mark of the Beast. Uh, so we talked about it for a full week. How did mm -hmm. you deal with two days of not talking about it anymore? What was your experience coming out of a week of talking about the Mark of the Beast for yourself and maybe if you had any relation with other people? Well, I had not had the opportunity. I shared a little bit with Brian and Sandy, uh, Deacon Brian and his wife, Sandy. Mm -hmm. um, 
But as far as the mark of the beast, what I had come out of it, you know, through my understanding is that the mark of the beast consists of, you know, the Roman Empire and the, and the religious leaders, you know. Um, yes, you know, uh, I, I thought, I believe the, uh, the, the sea beast was the Roman Empire and the land beast were, were the uh, religious leaders and they, 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 they use one another in various ways. Uh, um, and then the zealots, they, they, they were uh, somewhat against the Romans, but yet they worked in cahoots when it came to the uh, persecution of the, uh, and the killing of, the, of, of some of the, uh, the Christians and the believers. Uh, they used the uh, Roman uh, authority in that regard, uh, but they were still up against the Romans in that case. And according to some of the notes that I had had, I think I had given it to the Seventh Day Adventist people, but I had notes on on a, on an exhortation that I had given about uh, 70 AD, or it might be in my notebook in the rack that we keep our material in. And in there, it stated that the, the zealots were like the man of lawlessness. Mm -hmm. So you have the man of lawlessness, you have the beast, you have you have the, the sea beast, the land beast, you know, and that's what I had come up with. That's good. I appreciate that. So, you know, what's interesting is if you were to do the review, you go back in this podcast that I just started a little bit ago and you listen to what I said in outlining the mark of the beast, we're pretty much right there with one another. So, uh, you know, it's good to hear, brother. And I'm glad that it provided that clarity to you. And I hope that you continue to uh, carry it forward like you did with Deacon uh, Brian and Sandy. So, uh, Edward, did you get an opportunity to uh, watch the, uh, and again, I joked with uh, Zach earlier, uh, I say opportunity loosely. Uh, did you get the opportunity to uh, watch the uh, session I had with uh, Sean Griffin this past Friday? Yes, I saw it live. I saw the whole thing. Okay, cool. Good deal. So you're ready, ready to roll here, I hope, and uh, lean in on yes, some discussion. <laughs> All right, cool. So, uh, by the way, I don't know if you heard me when I began the program. I want to thank you for you know giving me this opportunity because again, this is our program. So you're yeah. giving me an opportunity to express my post, you know, dialogue thoughts. And I wanted to thank you for that, not only tuning in, but then being willing to join me and allow me to use up our time here. Yes, thank you for the opportunity, for, you know, to to share and allowing me the opportunity to share as well. Good deal, man. We're full of opportunity. Look at the good <laughs> yeah. <of> us. <laughs> All right, man. So let's jump in on this. So if I may, uh, the first thing I want to do is I want to provide context to the dialogue that I had. And I believe that's important because, you know, as you know, I often say is audience relevance is far more than just the way that we read the Bible. You, you know, you need to know why you're speaking to people, how you're speaking to people. Uh, you know, there's a difference. If let's say Sean Griffin was a family member of mine, uh, there's obviously a difference in the way that we're dialoguing, the way that we understand each other. Uh, if, you know, let's say you and I, some people might say, why do Mike and Edward come together and do these, uh, these videos? You know, there's so many other people on the internet they could be doing videos with. And, uh, you know, and people would then later learn, oh, they're members of the same church. They serve together. They, they mm -hmm. see each other at least three or four times a week. Uh, you know, that's important. Then also that helps understand our dialogue with each other, mm -hmm. why we might talk to each other the way that we do and have such a familiarity with each other. Because again, we spend four out of seven days together, uh, you know, yeah. and not all the, all the whole day, of course, mm -hmm. but we, and not, we have opportunity to see each other, which again is a blessing. I, I, uh, yes. I want to praise God for Blue Point Bible Church and the privilege that we have to get to know people and have that relationship. So that being said, context of conversation is important. Now, I was contacted, somebody reached out to me on social media, uh, asked me if I'd be interested in doing a debate with someone that was not a full preterist. I obviously said, uh, yeah, you know, I'd be willing. Uh, my first question usually is, well, what does that person believe? You know, because I want to know what I'm getting myself into and so forth. So uh, after some discussion, uh, I had contacted Sean myself and I, I let him know that somebody reached out to me. It was not Sean. Uh, somebody had reached out to me third party and asked me if I wanted to participate in a debate. I told Sean that I have, a, you know, I sent him a link to my bio where I have my debates listed there so you can see my character my doctrine uh you know my conduct and so forth so 
after some discussion, he said to me, well, you know, I'm not so much looking for a debate as I am looking for a dialogue. And it was interesting as I received that message from him, I was in the middle of going through study with my brother and my brother told me flat out, he said, you know, if, um, you know, if you ask me, I have more, I gain more from dialogue than I do watching you do those formal debates. So I said, mm -hmm. all right, cool. You know, I, I could agree with that as well. So let's, let's go for a dialogue. Now, again, I don't know this man. That's, you know, that's important to put up uh, right up front there. I don't know this man. And uh, I said, okay, I'll agree to just doing a, a random dialogue. Now, what's of importance here is he did not send me not one outline. You know, there's nothing, no, no, you know, this is what we're going to talk about, not a two sentence, you know, paragraph or, or a formal outline or anything. So all I knew was I, I didn't even receive a graphic from him. I knew that I saw on his YouTube page, he posted a picture of me and, and him. And it said the picture many of you probably saw where it says, has the Lord, uh, has the day of the Lord already occurred? So I figured, okay, so the topic of this program is going to be, has the day of the Lord already occurred? That was my only substance of an outline that I received regarding this, uh, th you know, this di dialogue. So uh, he did not send me an outline of any sorts. I, uh, what I did was I went back and I watched his video on the day of the Lord. And I encourage everybody watching this, go back, you know, again, watch the video I did with him, of course. But what you should do prior to that is watch the video he did. Uh, it's on his YouTube page, the, the, uh, the video, if you've watched the video, uh, what is it, Kingdom in Context. Uh, if you go there and you search through, he has two videos particularly on the doctrines of demons. And I realized the one on the coming of the Lord, it doesn't say it in the description. It says milk and meat uh, podcast or something to that effect. So if you go there and you watch the doctrine of demons, milk and meat live stream, uh, then that will take you into what his view of the, uh, the, of the, um, of the, the Lord. right. So the, from his, his perspective, so I went ahead and I watched that first. I just want to let people know, I know uh, somebody had asked me in our uh, Facebook live here, how do they join our Zoom? Uh, the way that you join our Zoom is you could either call in. I don't have the call-in number handy right now. However, uh, I will give you the Zoom session number. The Zoom session is 698-689-7086. And I'm going to repeat that for you one more time. 698-689-7086. And one of the best ways to find all of the information regarding the Power of Preterism Network's conference calls or things like that is obviously to visit our Facebook page, the Power of Preterism Network. And uh, we usually post all the information, the graphics. There's a graphic for this discussion that's usually shared throughout social media. Uh, I'm gonna see if I can find it here real quick and then I'll get right back on track with what I was sharing. I have the call-in number available. Uh, well, if you'd like to go ahead and share that, Edward, I'm going to try to find it here as the graphic, but please share the phone number as well. Okay, it's 1-646-558-8656. That's 1-646-558-8656. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, and I'm realizing I do have the uh, video here, the picture, the graphic, but... I'm not finding it. 698-689-7086. So uh, again, I'm going to jump right back into what we were talking about there. And Edward, I apologize. I didn't change your name. Uh, doing some housekeeping, folks. <laughs> uh, all right, cool. So uh, so let's get back on track here. Now, what we're, uh, what I was saying was that, you know, giving you some background around this, this conversation. And... Uh, I went ahead and I watched his video on Doctrine of Demons, the Day of the Lord. And uh, I have to say, I'm not too sure that he went back. And many of you that watched the, the, the dialogue probably would say the same. I don't know that he went back and watched any of my previous debates or work or teachings on the, on the coming of the Lord. So it's hard to have a dialogue with someone that doesn't necessarily know what it is that you believe, but they believe that you're wrong. And uh, that was something that I... I felt needed to be uh, outlined. You know, if I may share a quote here uh, from Dallas Willard. Again, he's a, a, a great theologian. He's passed away. However, his work continues to be uh, a blessing uh, to many. So he said this, I don't live with the assumption that I am right about everything. I don't live with the assumption that I am right about everything, but I live with the assumption that we should earnestly inquire 
and use our minds together under God to seek understanding. So I, I, live, I don't live with the assumption that I'm right about everything, but what I do live with the assumption of is that I've studied these things out, that I've spent time around other believers, I've searched out the thoughts, I've searched out other people's thoughts, and that's why I come to the conclusion that I'm right about the things that I'm positing or the things that I'm teaching, and I believe that to be important. So, uh, Edward, uh, is there anything you want to jump in there and you want to, you want to say? I don't want to overshadow anything you might want to share uh, as I'm talking. I would hope that um, through the understanding and the study in which you do, that whoever that you're just having a discussion, a conversation, debate with, that not that they're doing the same study, but they're, they're uh, interested in the Bible enough to study the Bible uh, to, you know, to the best of their ability to whereas they can be open to Bible study, like you had described, as far as, you know, uh, like being on the same page, as far as, you know, interested in what the Bible has to say. Right. Yeah. You know, if I may, I want to lean in on that, but what I, one thing I did want to say is that, uh, oh no, I lost it. I, there was a point I wanted to make, um, in regards to something you just said, but either way, uh, you know, that I, I think we were on the same page, Sean and I, that we both want to lean in on what the Bible says. Oh, you had pointed out that you want to go back and you want to learn, uh, you know, what the people believe that you're going to debate or dialogue. I did want to say one reason why I highlighted that it was not a debate was because in a debate, you have an outline and you know what you're, you're, you're already, you have foresight into what you're going to come into the, the discussion debating and, and proving. I did not have that. All I knew was we were there to talk about has the day of the Lord already come. I didn't know how long the discussion was going to be. I had asked him that at the beginning. He basically let me know that they kind of do a loose. Uh, it could go two, three hours. I let him know that I, you know, I, I was more of a 90 minute uh, type of person to kind of sum up our thoughts and then plan further discussions down the road, uh, but not make these long, exhausting discussions. Namely, and I'm going to lean in on this during our discussion, but one of the reasons I believe that is because it's impossible to do a full review of a two and a half hour session rather than going through a 90 minute discussion and then marking out our differences which hopefully you saw during the discussion, my goal kept being to, since I already knew we were kind of going all over the place, I said, let's at least outline what we disagree on. And I believe that's how, you know, our first goal should be to be simple. You know, we can get into, there's things that are perplexing, no doubt about it. But what we need to do first is have some sort of a basis of where we agree and where we disagree. And that was one of the things that I was trying to chase down during the discussion. So this wasn't necessarily a debate. This was supposed to be, you know, this was supposed to be a dialogue. And if you will, it was supposed to be a dialogue that it was supposed to be a dialogue that I thought, since I'm going on his program, mm -hmm. he's already taught about the day of the Lord, that I was going to basically share my views. So I came into that, you know, not knowing that I was going to be sort of squaring up, if you will. Uh, and not that I have the issue with, you know, squaring up on the spot uh, in regards to theology. It was just, I didn't have that force, that knowledge, you know, uh, so I, I didn't know that's what we were doing. So if I may say this, I did enjoy the time with Sean, and I actually am praying for and hoping for future times to join with him on his program and maybe even have him join with us here. Uh, I felt comfortable speaking with him. I did write a little bit of this, so I just want to share the way I wrote it. Uh, I felt comfortable speaking with him as if dialoguing disagreeably uh, with a friend sitting on my couch. And I do this a lot. So, you know, something that's something I'm very familiar with. I have a lot of friends with a lot of different views. So I've learned how to have dialogue in the midst of disagreement. Mm -hmm. And uh, he opened up, if you, you know, you watch the session, he opened up by allowing me to explain my view of preterism. And he did give me ample time. You know, I, that needs to be noted. He gave me ample time to offer up at least my thoughts of why I believe what I believe. Uh, obviously, when we got to the scriptures, I don't know that I, I felt that he was giving me ample time to really say what I needed to feel to say before he would answer another, ask another question, which is another topic. Uh, during that time, I gave clarity, healing, and strategy as my, my outline of preterism, the power of preterism, and how I've come to understand it. Uh, and I outlined the problems with eschatology. I said that there were so many views, if you remember this part there, I said there's so many views, there's a gamut of different views of eschatology within futurism, uh, and that caused confusion for me preterism, when I began to look, oh, you look at it through the lens of the original audience, not listening to who your favorite preacher on TVN is. 
you, you know, that's not the way to do it. Or your favorite contextual Bible study uh, notes or something, you know, that, that's not the way to do it. You have to understand it from the original audience's perspective. So you have to gain a running knowledge of that culture and those people. And, and when you read you, don't necessarily say, oh, me, say, oh, them, you know. Uh, so that was a big deal for me. That brought clarity. And uh, then I talked about how one of my problems with universalizing prophecy was that it, you know, it, it created confusion for me because I was reading texts that were applying to, let's say, Israel, and I was applying them to myself. I was reading it as if it was talking to everybody, or I was reading Old Testament text where it said judgment would come upon the world, and I was saying, oh, that's the whole world, without understanding, oh, well, there's definitely context of Old Testament judgments uh, that came upon certain places uh, in certain regions and didn't necessarily happen all over the planet. We know in the New Testament, for example, when uh, you see the census taken at Jesus's birth, we know that wasn't all over the physical world. We know that that was during, you know, in that known world, that empire. So I explained these things as my problems with futurism. I also mentioned not only, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of this program, uh, the problem with futurism for me was not only what we believed being so confusing, but also what we believed we needed to be doing. That seemed to be very confusing. You know, uh, if you believe the mark of the beast is coming, what should we do? Should we just make sure we're out street preaching to get everybody raptured? Should we be getting ready? Uh, should we actually plan to move to the mountains? Uh, or is that only for Judea? If that's only for Judea, for Judea, what other wisdom is only for Judea? You know, and, and it becomes this very perplexing, confusing paradigm rather than looking at the at everything through the lens of audience relevance and really taking that into account. So uh, for me, that's where preterism has been very beneficial and I think con uh, highlights the problems of futurism. And many times during our dialogue, if you noticed, I felt the need, uh, oh, I, I wrote here in my notes, I'm disappointed with his perspective of Bible prophecy. And many times during our dialogue, I felt the need to tell him that he's making things more complicated than necessary. You know, he was jumping around to different texts. Uh, if you remember, uh, Sean asked this question, he said, you guys take the kingdom of God to be the body of believers. That was one of the things that I, I didn't say that. Those were not my words. Those, those were his words. And, you know, that to me was, he jumped in and he just said that as I was talking. And I, I was like, well, <laughs> that, that's going to take a little bit of an outline what we believe the kingdom of God is. Uh, then, uh, and hopefully everybody noticed uh, that Sean does not believe that you're necessarily unsaved if you believe in doctrines of demons. So he created, the, you know, this view where you can believe in the doctrines of demons, apparently, and still be saved, uh, according to him, uh, which obviously for me creates some confusion. Uh, so, Edward, well, you know, uh, have I said anything that you want to jump in and, and uh, respond to, or uh, should I just keep going with the sort of outline I've prepared? Well, I just wanted to say, you know, about the audience relevance, you know, how, how, how you described how important it is, because which it is, because... Um, um, talking about the uh, the new the New Testament, you know, you have how they refer to the Old Testament, which you have to familiarize yourself with the Old Testament, and you have to understand why, you know, like what was going on during the period of time that the prophets were sent to speak to to whatever audience, you know, that gives you a reason that tells you why that they had to speak to whatever audience, you know, what sin or what idolatry that they were under or whatever, you know, the reason why the prophet was sent, the message of the prophet, you know, the response of the people, how they received it, you know, and why God gave it to the prophet to speak to the people and all of this, you know, is was all necessary to understand. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of it, you know, you can't just get it through scripture, which you know, it has to correspond with scripture, of course, but sometimes you have to go to Bible history. Sure. You know, you have to go outside of the Bible to study and, and you have to, you know, look for resources that apply, you know, properly to get the proper context of, of what the prophet and, you know, the message was, you know, and the interpretation of the prophet's message, you know. Well said, you know, again, we, we, there's so much that goes into context. And when we're saying context, hopefully, and what you just highlighted in my estimation is we have to ask narrative questions. We have to ask questions that help us gain 
reading comprehension. So, you know, that's going to be important, by the way. Uh, what I hope to do here with our program is I'm not hoping to ramble for two or three days about the, about the debate. What I'm hoping I, I want to do is um, actually mark out things that we need to study. What I hope to do is exactly what I wanted to do on Friday night. So, uh, you know, I think asking some narrative questions, which I actually have outlined here, uh, is of utmost importance. And I think you're, you rightly just leaned in on them. You know, when we're reading certain prophetic texts, we have to take in a host of different questions. What did it mean to the prophet in that time? How would Jesus and the apostles apply it in the New Testament? Mm. How were they applying it to their time? Uh, and then, and only then, should we find an application for ourselves. But what we don't need to do, and, and you know, we're going to lean in on this. Hopefully, you've noticed one of the biggest problems with futurism is they seem to want to create types out of the anti-type. Christ came to fulfill what the prophets pointed to. There's plenty of fulfillment in the prophets themselves in their historical time, but there was the hope of Israel, which never came about. Even when Israel came out of Babylon, so had the temple set up, for some reason, the Ark of the Covenant wasn't there. God's presence wasn't there. God was not happy with them. And then you feel, then you have the time of the 500 years of, you know, of uh, God seemingly, it wasn't that he was silent. It's that he was not necessarily uh, speaking through the prophets of Israel, because if you spur my word, then you know what? Fine. So be it. I won't speak to you. And, and that's what the Lord was doing through that period of time until the time of the Messiah, the fullness of time. So it's important to know that because futurism, what they're trying to do is they're trying to say, well, yeah, Christ, that was a coming of the Lord. That was something too that, that mattered in fulfillment of Bible prophecy. But that happened in the Old Testament too. And in my problem, when people say that, I say, yeah, but you don't see why Christ's time was the, the anti-type. The Apostle Paul says it many times where he says, you know, those things were shadows. This is the fulfillment. Matter of fact, 1 Corinthians 10. I heard a great sermon from a man named Mike Cornett. And Edward, you'll like this. Uh, Mike Cornett preached on the feasts of the Lord uh, yesterday at uh, Holston PBU Church. And uh, in that message, he talked about, you know, audience relevance. And he talked about basically everything we're highlighting right here and how we need to take in, uh, you know, the proper uh, understanding of, audience relevance and, and and how the feast of the Lord were fulfilled. And uh, ultimately, I, I'm sorry, I lost my point. Um, how Christ's ministry was the fulfillment of the types of the Old Testament, that this isn't just another version of fulfillment. And then we're going to yet see me and you uh, another future fulfillment that overshadows Christ's time of fulfillment. No, that was the time of fulfillment. So uh, again, I thought, uh, I think that's very important. You know, we need to take in all of that when we're trying to lean in on uh, what the prophets are pointing at, what they're talking about, et cetera. And Edward, you know, we've been doing that here at the Blue Point Bible Church. We've taken three years almost now uh, to journey from, in a chronological order, Hosea, we went to Joel, we went to Micah, we went to Abadiah, we find ourselves now in Isaiah, and we've been reading in a contextual sense, just taking our time and really trying to understand what was the hope of the prophets. Amen. And, you know, in every chapter we go through, obviously, you know, I say at the end of our session. So where in there did you see a hope for to die and go to heaven and get a new body and and live on a restored planet? I mean, find it. And, and it's not there when you do the contextual reading. But as you noticed, I'm sure when you do proof texting and you try to build the doctrine, mm -hmm. uh, you can create, you know, as the futurist community, unfortunately, has they've built a doctrine of this uh, immortal body, uh, this is this glorified body uh, that they're going to uh, enjoy. So uh, that's a topic that we're definitely going to have to lean in on and see if that's yeah. what the prophets were actually hoping for. Yes. So obviously, uh, if you don't mind, I'm just going to move along here. Uh, one of the things that uh, there were a lot of confusing moments during the debate, right? And uh, I made a point not to say that I was confused by him. He said he was confused by me a couple of times, uh, but I, I made it my point not to say I was confused by him because I wasn't. However, there were some confusing moments during the, uh, the dialogue. For example, he didn't go to the text that he mentioned in his video on the day of the Lord. That was the first thing that threw me for a loop was, well, wait a minute. You just did a whole presentation on the day of the Lord. Why are we going to Isaiah too? Why don't we go to Isaiah I think the first text that he had marked out was, uh, sorry, give me one moment. I think it was Isaiah 14. 
Let me double check. Isaiah 13, sorry about that. He had uh, cited um, 2 Thessalonians, Joel, we're gonna get into that. Uh, but that was what he did in his video that he taught, not where he was talking with me, but where he taught about the day of the Lord. So in my estimation, I thought that we were going to return back to that discussion, you know, and, and build on top of things that he had previously established. He didn't, obviously he went to a whole new text. And he said, if you remember, the first text we jumped to was uh, Isaiah 2. And uh, when we went over to Isaiah 2, he said, the whole reason he brought me there was, well, what would you say about this? And obviously, I had just been explaining uh, the contrast between um, about the kingdom of God and the heaven and the heaven, et cetera. And then he, uh, he brought me over to Isaiah 2 about fulfillment of, oh, that's what it was. Uh, Matthew chapter 5, we were talking about uh, Bible prophecies, uh, uh, prophets and the law. And then he said, well, in fulfillment of the law, when would you say this happened? And he brought me over to Isaiah chapter two. Again, for me, that was perplexing because I said, well, he just did a whole presentation. Why not take me to the text that you brought up? However, uh, that was one issue. Uh, then uh, when I would explain things, hopefully you noticed this. And again, he gave me ample time to explain my view and how I came to my view. But when we got to the biblical texts, when I began to really get into the meat of what the text was saying, he would jump in and ask a new question. I don't know if you noticed that. And Edward, please feel free to jump in. Well, what I believe, though, is that the reason why he was jumping in is because as you were speaking, you were stepping on his toes as far as what he believed. <laughs> so mm -hmm. therefore, you know, he had to, while he had fresh in his mind, what had come up in his mind as you were speaking, he had to like let it out to right. try to fit his paradigm which it did not because his paradigm was like basically off, you know, because his, his, his hermeneutics and everything like that, his, his belief in Genesis, you know, was totally off. So therefore, you know, the rest of his stuff is going to be off. So That's right. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up again. Hopefully if you're taking notes on that dialogue, if you're really leaning in on this study, uh, you know, again, we're going to need to write down and make note of the things that we disagreed on so that we can study them out. And maybe as you're rightly pointing out, Edward, uh, and again, well, again, let me make my point there and then I'll return back to that. Uh, write these things down so that we can study them out. And then that'll help us gain maybe clarity in regards to why we have such a distinction in our understanding. Now, what I wanted to return back to was that's not necessarily a wrong thing. I'm sure we could agree on that. That, you know, there's times where I know you're in Bible study and, you know, we, we, you're listening and you're like, wait a minute, I got, I just have to get this out right now. You know, and yeah. I have, to, it has to, but hopefully there's times where we can hold back. Hopefully, there's more times of holding back than not holding back. Uh, mm -hmm. For the spirit is self control. Yeah. However, uh, there's times where you just need to jump in. You know, wait a minute, wait a minute. I need you to back up and you know, explain this. He did. You know, you you're right there though. He did bring up some strange stuff. Like you know, we'd be talking, and then right out of nowhere, he said, uh, "Well, let's talk about the messianic ministry of Christ." You know, I'm like, "Well, wait a minute." Yeah, I mean, I get that we need to establish those things, but. This dialogue is about has the Lord the coming of the Lord already occurred. So we should have marked out that we had an issue with the uh, ministry of Christ prior to, you, you know, the, the dialogue. Um, you know, I didn't know. And I ended up learning later on uh, that there is some serious distinctions. Not only did I learn during that dialogue, but even going back and reviewing some of his teachings, listening to or reading through the comments there uh, in that, that YouTube video. I've realized there's some serious discussions that need to happen in regards to the messianic ministry of Christ. Uh, I don't know if you caught this. They don't believe that we're in the new covenant. Uh, he doesn't believe that we're in the new covenant. He believes that I guess we're still in some sort of a brief temporary moment or something because he said, and I'm going to quote him here in a moment. I don't know if I have the notes right here, uh, but he talked about we, we enter into the new covenant when we get new bodies. And I would agree with that, but I think the new body is the new covenant. And you enter into yes. the new covenant body uh, by, uh, you know, by being in Christ. But again, that's a topic that we'll have to lean in on. So, yeah, that was one of the perplexing things he brought up was the messianic ministry of Christ out of nowhere, just jumped in and brought it up. Then, uh, if you remember, there was the dialogue about the institution of the law. Then we got into a whole thing about morality, about whether I believe it's okay to kill people or kidnap people or, uh, you know, all these strange, uh, again, which I thought, don't we all agree on this? That, you know, morality, I, I didn't know that that was something we needed to lean in on. However, he did bring it up that this is discipleship. 
I, I don't know that we were doing the dialogue for the purpose of discipleship. So, you know, what this should do is encourage each of us to, when we're going to do dialogues with people, we have to find a place of reference or otherwise we're just, you know, it's almost small talk with big words. That's all we're doing. We're, you know, small talk. You don't really remember what you were talking about after you leave the conversation. Mm -hmm. So uh, serious talk, hopefully it means something you're taking it in and you're meditating upon it. So I would encourage us not to have small talk with big words, you know, you know make sure we're really finding substance in the things that we're saying and in the conversations we're having. So that was, again, that was some perplexing stuff for me. Uh, he made it a point to show he was confused by my teaching without wanting to mark out how and why we have our differences. And again, I think you leaned in on that topic a moment ago, Edward, where it seems as though he was trying to defend his presuppositions, but not wanting to really highlight them, you know, not wanting to say, okay, well, this is what you believe. Like we did get into a bit of discussion about biblical cosmology. However, again, I was not prepared to, uh, to get into that discussion, which from my vantage point, it's not about defining a word and running to proof texts. It's actually about understanding the cultural context, which on a daily basis, if I may admit this, on a daily basis, I don't spend my time thinking about what people 10,000 years ago thought about. Uh, you know, and what they were were doing with their lives and things. So, my, you know, for me, it requires a little bit of preparation, a little bit of renewing my mind and studying mm -hmm. out what, you know, the topic might be. So my point being, uh, he brought up a lot of stuff that I felt that maybe what we need to do, and Edward, you remember this, I did a dialogue with Robert Iannicelli, Pastor Robert Iannicelli. Mm -hmm. What we had done previously was we met, we talked, and we realized where we disagreed. And we planned a discussion where we went through five highlights of the Bible and we marked out, we agreed on this like outline, you know, and we said, uh, so let's start with Genesis creation. Then let's move into the law of Moses. Then let's go into the prophetic picture. Then let's talk about the messianic ministry. Then mm -hmm. let's talk about eschatology. And it was those five things that we used as our sort of way of finding agreement and disagreement. And I get to praise God that God, you know, through me as a vessel, of course, studying with him and talking with him, led him to an understanding of Genesis, basically the view I have, uh, through those dialogues. Now, he, the goal was to obviously talk about preterism and get him to come over to the preterist understanding. However, using the same lens that we do uh, with to understand Bible prophecy through audience relevance, Pastor Robert Iannicelli admitted during that dialogue that his view on Genesis had changed. So, mm -hmm. you know, so again, I bring that up because I think that's the way we need to do dialogues. We need to understand where we agree, where we disagree, and then begin to mark out those points uh, as areas of conversation. Otherwise, we're just going to talk forever and disagree forever. What I found with Sean is that when he had asked you, where do you go when you die? Or, um, and, and things of that nature, it, it, it appears as though um, he doesn't believe in the Holy Spirit nor the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, the purpose of Jesus' death, uh, all of these things he seems not to not to comprehend. Um, because when I, I when you when you talk about, you know, um, uh, when you believe in Christ, you will never die and stuff like that. And these are concepts that, you know, that the scripture talks about. That requires a little study, I guess, to understand, but he had no concept of it. Well, <laughs> he had no concept of it. Yeah, you're right. You're right. He, he, he did lean in on a lot of topics that I felt, you know, uh, needed to be uh, needed to be better, you know, outlined. Like, for example, one of the things that he said to me was. Uh, what do you mean by fulfillment? Remember, we were talking about uh, mm -hmm. I forget what text we were bringing up and he said, what do you mean by fulfillment? And I sat there for a moment and I said. I remember there was a discussion when I was in Bible college. I forget what text it would always, what does it mean that Christ said, I come to fulfill, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the law, uh, not to abolish, but to fulfill. And uh, I remember that discussion. So I was trying to bring my mind back. And I was like, for the sake of this conversation, I thought we understand what I believe about the word fulfill. It means that it happened. Fulfillment. Exactly, it, exactly. It, it needed to come to pass happened. So, you know, it kind of threw me for a loop. And uh, then if you notice, I reversed it on him. I said, okay, well, what do you believe? Because again, this was a dialogue. This wasn't me being yes. interviewed. This wasn't supposed to be a debate. This was supposed to be a dialogue. So I said, well, what do you believe about fulfillment? And I quoted him here. This is what he said. I'd take it in context 
of what was being spoken about personally. So why couldn't I just answer like that? You, you know, why that, that doesn't answer anything. You know, we were talking about a biblical text. He jumped in and asked me what I believe about fulfillment. I explained that I believe it means that it needed to come to pass. I believe it was the text of Matthew 5, uh, verses 17 through 18 there, or maybe I like to include 16 in that. So, um, yeah, and then he jumped in, and then he, he basically didn't offer up an explanation either. He's basically saying, well, I'd have to see what it means in the context of where we're using it. Well, okay, here we are in Matthew chapter 5. And if you don't mind, I'm going to read Matthew chapter 5. Open up our Bible, folks. I've been talking long enough. <laughs> uh, real quickly here. Uh, just want to read it word for word and get the verbiage right. I'm reading out of the uh, NASB. And here in Matthew chapter 5, yeah, actually, let's start with verse 17 and read to verse 19. That's what I mean to say. Matter of fact, let's read 17 to 19. Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I came not to abolish, but to fulfill. So again, the question he had asked me was, what do you mean by fulfill? Truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, again, of importance is Jesus did tell his Jewish followers at this point in the gospel of Matthew, uh, when, as you follow the narrative, all of Jesus's followers are Jewish. And he told them that they need to listen to and do the teachings of the Pharisees. I believe that's in uh, somewhere nestled in uh, Matthew chapters 21 through 23. And uh, again, so he says to do and to listen to and do those things that they were teaching because they were under the law. Yes. And what Jesus is saying here is that as he's going about his ministry and he's making disciples, and again, he's showing the, the problems with the law, you know, that that's, you follow uh, the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter five, and, and you see what he's basically saying. He's showing them that they, they've been following the letter, but not the spirit. And then he goes on to say that I have not come to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. What do you mean by fulfill? Well, if he didn't come to abolish them, then he came to do what they were pointing to. That would be fulfillment. He came to accomplish that which needed to be done. And I believe I explained fulfillment uh, just well, fine uh, on the program there. So I didn't really find it as a place of disagreement. I was a bit perplexed as to why he jumped in when I was trying to explain uh, that, that whole point there. And then if you remember, Sean reminded us that Bible prophecy was fulfilled before Christ which again, that leans in on what I was talking about before about types and antitypes. If you remember, I began to talk about the coming of the Lord and uh, we talked about Bible prophecy finding its fulfillment and Sean thought it was necessary to remind us that Bible prophecy found its fulfillment in the Old Testament. Yes, amen. You know, when Isaiah prophesied something that was important and I wanted to bring this up on the program. Uh, by the way, I did bring an outline with me uh, for the way that I thought a flow of conversation might go. It did not go that way. However, one of the points that I thought needed to be made uh, when we read prophetic literature, and you'll understand this when you watch his video uh, on the day of the Lord, uh, his teaching alone, when you read the prophetic literature, you need to find their immediate context. Isaiah prophesied about things that were happening in his time. Otherwise, he would have been stoned to death and called a false prophet. So he was speaking to his time. However, there was one thing that did not happen that the prophets kept saying would happen, and it was the restoration. It was the establishment of Mount Zion. It was Jerusalem to be who she was called to be. And again, all that they found through the law, which the Apostle Paul makes clear in his writings, was the law actually showed them to be a problem, to be the byword. You know, the prophet said that if you do not follow these things, you will become a byword among the nations. So Israel, even after coming out of Babylonian captivity, did not find themselves restored. 500 years did not find themselves restored. Then all of a sudden, Jesus Christ is born on the scene. That's what the Apostle Paul is making clear in Galatians 4.4. 4. At the fullness of time, Christ was born under the law to redeem those that were under, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those that were under the law. And 
I love what the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapters 9 and 15, where he's basically explaining that the law was given to the old covenant Jews for the purpose of the Gentiles glorifying God for his mercy. A matter of fact, he says specifically, uh, Romans 15, 8, for Christ became a servant to the circumcision to confirm the promises given to the fathers and for the Gentiles to glorify God for his mercy. So again, my point when I talk about the prophetic literature is that, yes, the prophets found their fulfillment in their time, primarily. And then the, the main point, though, again, not, not, I don't want to say primarily. Let me say immediately. However, the, the, the point of those prophecies was to point to Jesus, which, again, the whole New Testament makes clear. So while, yes, there were prophecies that found their fulfillment in the Old Testament, what we're talking about when we're talking about the coming of the Lord and Bible prophecy in the first century is that it was the complete fulfillment. It was the antitype. It's not another shadow to, you know, find its fulfillment at another time. That was the time of fulfillment. Simeon the prophet in Luke chapter two knew it. So why can't we get it? You know, that's kind of my, that, that's my idea there, Edward. And hopefully I didn't ramble too far, but I think that, you know, that's how we need to understand prophetic literature. Correct. Right. Good. Well, I'm glad you're following me. And, and again, I, I realize as I'm saying that it leans in on exactly what you were bringing up before about the, you know, I call it the five W's and the one H, who, you know, who, what, where, why, when, and how, uh, you know, we need to be asking that, but then also asking ourselves, well, then what was the hope of Israel? What did the prophets point to that they did not have that the apostle Paul in Acts chapters 24 and 26 is saying, He's speaking nothing other than what was revealed in the law and the prophets. And he's saying it pointed to Jesus and what Jesus was going to accomplish. Yes. You know, that again, I, and I realize as I listen to Sean and his teachings, uh, that's an area of conversation in and of itself. Again, the highlighting the messianic ministry. Uh, you know, if you get, and you know this, Edward, if you get any of those five things I detailed before wrong, uh, you, you know, you're going to end up with some faulty views. You know, so we need to be leaning in on what, what do we call the messianic ministry? Uh, what was that bringing to an end, if we want to better understand eschatology? What does that have to do with our protology? What we're saying about Genesis creation? And, you know, that, that together. and I like how you how you go to Bible scripture, um, because I noticed Sean, he kept saying, I, I, how I understand uh, these, the, the definitions of these words and how and how I apply it to, you know, the, mm -hmm. uh, to get the narrative or however, but he says a lot of I, you mm -hmm. know, how I understand it or how I interpret these words, you know, instead of how the Bible interprets it and how the author had intended it to be understood and how the audience would have received it. Instead of saying that, he's like, you know, how I understand the mm -hmm. definition of these words. And, you know, you know, it's like he's using like when Peter uh, re tried to rebuke Jesus about him going to the cross, and Jesus said, "You know, you know, you don't speak of the things of God, but but of the things of man." You know, he's he's thinking of the things of man, you know, over you know the things of God. You know, he's allowing his interpretation of the Bible instead of the Bible interpreting, you know, his understanding. So that was the issue that yeah. you know. You know, actually, I was but. That's a good point, Edward. Uh, that's exactly what I was trying to lean in on at the beginning of the program. If you remember, right before we went over to Bible, to actually going into Bible texts, right before we talked about Isaiah, uh, and I'm going to sort of end on this. I noticed we're up against the hour. So what I'd like to do yeah. is just make a point and maybe provide an outline for what we'll talk about in maybe the days to come. And then I'd like to bring some people on and let them kind of get some of their thoughts out. And again, we're going to continue to talk about this for the next couple of days uh, here on the Preterous Power Hour. Uh, but Edward, you bring up a great point. When right before we got into the Bible text, uh, I had to, I had to remind him of something. Uh, you know, uh, he he jumps to Isaiah two, and he says, or as we're reading, he says that didn't happen, that didn't happen. And I had to remind him, you know, just because you say something didn't happen, uh, you know, or that it's wrong, doesn't necessarily mean that it didn't happen or that it's wrong. And and that's important because of exactly what you just said. Uh, if you remember. I had challenged him with two major points when we we're understanding our Bible. And this is why I believe this is a good point to end off on uh, this morning. Uh, two major things we need to consider. The first thing is that when the Apostle Paul went to Berea and he proclaimed the word of God to those people there, 
they all had their own thoughts that they had made up in their mind, just like every other human being on the face of this planet has their own preconceived notions, has their own formed traditions, whether they're right or wrong is of secondary importance. The point I'm making is you have views. Therefore, now that you have views, what did the Bereans need to do that scripture marks out that they were noble? It says that they were more noble uh, than the, the, the Bere uh, Thessalonians in that they searched the scriptures to see if what the apostle Paul said was true. So we need to study the scriptures. But then, Edward, as you're pointing out, even if we study the scriptures, the Pharisees studied the scriptures, right? The Pharisees knew definitions, things they defined their way according to their tradition. And Jesus said, you search the scriptures thinking that in them you find eternal life. But basically, and I'm going to paraphrase, you're missing it right in front of you. It's me, Jesus. I am the fulfillment of what you're looking for. So these men searched the scriptures, had their own doctrines and understandings and teachings and traditions and definitions, and yet they missed the fulfillment. And that's why it's important for us to be sure that our view is, is in line with what Jesus Christ was accomplishing rather than maybe what we're projecting upon the text. So uh, in days to come, Edward, if you don't mind, real quickly, I'm just going to say uh, what I'd like to do is talk about the texts that were brought up on the show. I have a couple and I'll send you my outline. Uh, so we'll talk about some of the texts that we brought up. We're going to need to mark out the differences, which again, we've alluded to here a couple of times. So we'll talk through some of those differences, some things like biblical cosmology, some things like the tabernacle of God. Uh, for example, uh, if you go to his website right now, he has a video kingdom come number three, where he talks about that cube, that tabernacle that he believes is somewhere up in the sky. I have not yet listened to it. Uh, I'd love to lean in on his study and see why he's come to that conclusion. So uh, I will do that. I encourage everybody else, if you want to be a part of this dialogue, why not go and learn a little bit about what this man believes so that we could better uh, help him understand what it is that we believe. Uh, then after our different marking out the differences, uh, I, I'd like to share a bit more about if the conversation went my way, <laughs> you know, if uh, how I felt uh, maybe we should have outlined some of the things and, uh, and then what, we'll, what I'd like to do on this program as well is maybe cover some of the responses. Uh, each day we'll welcome people to share. Uh, however, I'd like to share some of the responses from some people here at Blue Point Bible Church. I'd like to share some responses from people that called me and messaged me uh, about the presentation and maybe still will. Uh, and then, of course, some of the YouTube comments. I don't know if you've went over to the YouTube page and looked at the video yet. Uh, there's at about 2,400 views and I think a little bit over 100 comments. Uh, so I'd like to review some of them and maybe talk through some of the points that people are making up in the making in the comments. And lastly, uh, actually, I'll bring this up. I'm going to conclude our program with mention of resources. But what I'd like to do, Edward, uh, if you don't have anything else you'd like to share, is unmute our guests and allow them to maybe share some thoughts at this time before we close out the program. Now uh, we we can hear from the guests. Yes. All right, cool. We got five days, brother. We got an hour every yeah. five days to get some yes. of our talk now. So let's. Let's let these gentlemen join us and see if there's anything they'd like to share. I know we got Zach and Richard here. Zach, you're unmuted. If you'd like to jump in, and Richard, you're unmuted as well. Uh, Zach, if you'd like to jump in first, if you have anything you want to share, Richard, uh, please follow. Uh, yeah, um, I echo your thoughts that it was pretty confusing and that uh, you guys are a little bit talking past each other, but I think that's just... Um, the nature of this type of dialogue. Um, yeah, there's some serious hermeneutical differences between you two, um, which I think made it a little bit hard um, to get on the same page and have the type of dialogue I think we were all hoping um, you would have. Um, there's a presumption on his part, I think, that the descriptions of that's going on in Genesis one are sort of driving the train of his hermeneutic. Um, and it seems like he didn't, um, at least in his dialogue with you, he didn't seem to be open to the possibility of the use of metaphorical and figurative language. Um, and when that was brought up, he seemed, he, I remember him saying, you know, well, who has the authority to say when 
poetic language is being used. Um, which, I mean, I guess is, it's a valid question, but then after you ended the dialogue and he was answering questions um, in the video, he seemed to admit that the, the Bible does use metaphorical and figurative language and, um, and just said that, well, I, you have to use it in a certain way according to its terms, which I think we can agree, but it's all seemed to be based on a physical and material interpretation of Genesis. And then also on, um, he showed this, the uh, cosmology that he pulled from Logos Bible software and Michael Heiser, mm -hmm. um, which it's, I mean, it's, it's too bad that the biblical authors didn't have access to that, but he seemed to be saying like, this is, we, we can say definitively that this is sort of the, the cosmological view of all the biblical authors and everybody up until, I'm not sure when that would end, but, um, and sort of takes that, as you pointed out, like an ultra literalist fashion, but I'm not sure where, other than that being a presupposition, I'm not sure where that comes from. And it, it presupposes that, you know, a lot of things about the authorship and timing of Genesis in relation to the other books. And um, it's it seems to be just a, a bare presupposition that he has that this Genesis 1 and this cosmology are the touchstones for my interpretation, and I'm going to see everything through the lens of these. Um, and in a very sort of physical, and I'm not sure if he would use the word material sense, but definitely a physical sense. I've, I mean, I've looked at some of his other videos, and he seems to say that, um, and I might, I could be corrected on this, but that God has, you know, a physical body and lives on a, sits on a physical throne above a physical dome over the earth in a physical city that um, I suppose based on Revelation, um, the end of Revelation will actually descend from the top of that firmament to, I guess, a mountain on earth. Um, so when, when dealing with that, I mean, it's, it's a little bit hard to, um, to get to where I think you know, the discussion should have gone, which is, you know, has the timing sort of the day of the Lord when um, you're dealing with that. Um, so, and, and I have another couple comments about, you know, specific verses, but I think I'll hold off on that until we talk about it um, okay. later this week, but. Yeah, tomorrow we're going to really try to lean in on some text. So uh, maybe we'll mention them and then, uh, you know, or even during the discussion time, if you'd like to bring them up and obviously the days to come as well. Um, I appreciate you watching the, the discussion. And uh, while I don't know that it was necessarily organized to bring edification in, in the way that I think it should have, uh, I hope that you were edified by at least being brought to the scriptures, maybe challenging some of your own notions, maybe seeing uh, some different views from his side. And obviously, uh, as you said, biblical cosmology was a uh, interesting discussion for me. Uh, in, in that regard, I've obviously leaned in on that topic. I have teachings, but as I mentioned in the opening, I, I wasn't necessarily prepared to, uh, you know, to kind of lean in on that topic. And yes, I do hold to a view that uh, you, you brought it up well, Zach, that, you know, we talked about um, where can you use metaphor and where can you not? And uh, th I think that's a good point and it does need to be understood. However, I would make the case, well, by understanding the genre of literature and by understanding the culture. That, that would be the way that I would understand terms that may not seem metaphoric to us, but maybe were to them, or vice versa, may seem metaphoric to us, but were not to them. So, uh, you know, I think that the way, the only way we can understand that is by figuring out what genre of literature we're reading, number one, and number two, uh, finding out things about that culture. Uh, so that's why I had mentioned uh, the background uh, culture, what is it? Uh, I always say it wrong. Uh, back, the Cultural Background Study Bible by John Walton. I don't agree with everything he says, but I think that he does, he leans in on a lot of good stuff 
uh, and he actually answers some of the questions that were brought up in regards to uh, biblical cosmology. And I noticed when you get to the, the, the cube in the sky, the heavenly Jerusalem, uh, John Walton also leans in on that topic a bit in regards to the measurement. So, uh, you know, that's where I appreciate that the, the things that you marked out, Zach, and I look forward to uh, leaning in on some of the biblical texts with you uh, tomorrow, maybe uh, as we continue uh, looking at some of the things that were brought up. Can I give a two line, uh, uh, a two line uh, comment on yeah. what Sean said and what uh, this, uh, what uh, Zach just uh, mentioned? Basically, yeah. I find that with Sean and people that hold the view to the physical city coming down and all of that stuff on the mountain and all of that from Revelation, they're taking it literally, and I I feel the reason why they're doing so is because of what they've been taught for so many years and for so many years, this has been taught because I was taught this many years ago and they're holding to doctrine that have been brought down through the ages through, um, what, is, what is the term? Um, um, from other pastors, but um, tradition mm -hmm. and, and things of that nature, instead of, you know, actually getting doing the background study and the historical studies like you had mentioned absolutely yeah absolutely we have I to consider agree. these things yeah we're we getting our hermeneutics we sure do we need to you know again and, and that was one of the major issues so you and zach are both definitely highlighting the, the hermeneutical differences you know the interpretational differences of specific things uh was a part big part of the study and uh, if we want to actually be edifying and really lean in on the study, rather than both of us just, as I mentioned before, small talk with big words, uh, rather than both of us just throwing up our ideas and then not knowing how to kind of figure out our differences, that continues to be a, a sort of uh, Achilles heel, if you will, for me, uh, where I, I don't want to just have dialogue with people and say, oh, well, I believe this and I believe this. I want to say, okay, well, now that we know you believe that and I believe this, how can we begin to sort of challenge each other's view what things need to be marked out? And that's given me a, an appreciation for Dr. Don K. Preston and the way that he does debates, because what he tries to do is lean in on that. Now, I might not always agree with the way he does it or well, if that's done, <laughs> that's a secondary topic. But I, I do believe that's what his goal is, is, is try to lean into the best of his ability of providing, you know, how can we mark out this topic clearly? And, and that way we could both really not just offer up our views, but we can lean in on study. So, uh, again, hermeneutical differences is a big deal. Richard, uh, did you want to share some thoughts and, and uh, let us know what you're thinking about the dialogue? Yeah, I, I, um, I'm, I'm going to start it out by saying this. Anybody can be a YouTube star these days, okay? Mm -hmm. You get the software on your computer, you know, you get a, a Facebook following, and suddenly you're an expert, <laughs> you know? And this, this, this gentleman, I'm very sincere, he's a seeker, you know, God bless him, and I pray for him. But he was totally unprepared for this debate. He, he had no logic. There was no, you know, he was just bouncing all over the place. And I've seen, and I'm going to say this to you, I, I, I've been wanting to say it to Don also. There are some people you probably shouldn't debate mm -hmm. because it's just not going to come to anything. They, they, you know, they have this thing where you, what you believe is so ridiculous. What these preterists believe is so ridiculous that they're going to play this game. They're going to do these debates. I mean, we've seen some of them recently on Facebook descend into absolute, you know, name calling and everything else. And, you know, I, sometimes I want to say, Don, you know, why don't you just end this debate? You know, <laughs> it's like, you know, it's just it's time to end this. It's not going to go anywhere. Um, so we have we have to keep that in mind. You have a, a level of knowledge, which these people are just not ready for. And, um, and not only that, they, they really believe they're right, like we all did in various times, and we still do. And, and you know, that's why I say every day, God, show me where I, you know, I'm wrong, you know? Uh, because I've been amazed all of my life how some people can have insight into scripture, which is stunning. And on another issue of scripture, be totally naive and, and, and wrong, you know? And I'll say, my God, how does that happen? God help me, What's my, where's my blind spots, you know? Uh, I don't think he was serious at all in this debate. I think he just wanted to, he was playing to his base. Um, and that's why now I think if I'm going to debate anybody on preterism, which I don't usually do, but I, I will say what I, what I do uh, in, a, in a second. Um, I, I will say, have you read any books 
by a preterist author. And who was the author? And if they don't have a name and they don't have a book, I'm not gonna debate them because they're not even gonna know the questions to ask. They're just gonna come purely from there. Now let them go through that book and you know come out with all the heresies and the doctrines of demons or whatever else, but at least you'll be within a preterist framework because they're taking it from a preterist book. Um, now here's, here's a technique that I'm finding works very well. Um, I, I don't try to persuade anyone to be a preterist, but I'll say something like, can a case be made from scripture that the Great Commission was fulfilled in the first century? Well, of course, they're going to say no. So then I'll read like the three verses, which are indisputable, <laughs> that show that, in fact, the Great Commission was fulfilled in the first century. And say, see, I'm not trying to make you a preterist. I'm just saying, can you admit that a case can be made from Scripture that the Great Commission was fulfilled in the first century? Mm -hmm. And if they believe scripture, which they claim to do, and you're reading them three, which is the number that, you know, for, for having backup in scripture, they can say yes. And I say, it doesn't mean you're a preterist. Don't worry. But mm. you've, you've awakened them to one tiny thing. And then you do it with something else. You know, like you start to get into time statements and, mm. and, and say, well, can a case be made from scripture that Jesus said he was coming in the first century? Then you read another three or four verses. And, and once again, you don't try to persuade him to be a preterist. You just try to say, can a case be made from scripture? And these are scripture people. They like reading the scripture. And most of the time, they don't read the ones that we're, we're really focused in on. So I have found that to be very successful in, in, in uh, breaking people down. What, you know, what he did to you was an embarrassment, in my opinion, because I could see that there were times you were sitting there saying, where do I go with this? How do I bring this back to some, some degree of sanity, you know, uh, because, you know, especially when he circles the words, you know, and it said, what, what was it? The word over or down or what, what was it? And it's uh, like 10 above, minutes above, above, above. Yeah. Oh yeah. And I'm saying, <laughs> I'm saying, Oh my God, please move this along. You'll even see my comments in there. I don't know if you notice it or not. But, uh, um, yeah. Anyhow, that, that's what I found to be very helpful. There's a lot of people that just are trying to be famous in this day and age, and they love to argue scripture, and they're going to play these games. So, you know, my advice may be to be a little more careful or use that method that I'm finding very successful uh, in getting people, you know, because they, when they leave, they're still not a preterist, but they got to say, oh, you can make a case about this, and you can make a case about this. Well, I don't believe that, but I see that a case can be made. Let me tell you, I've seen somebody make a case for the Virgin Mary as a Catholic church teaches that amazed me. I mean, when this guy was through talking about David and his mother and this and that, I said, wow, you can make a case in scripture. You don't have, you know, I don't agree with it. I don't agree with the conclusion, but I see how they got there. I see how they use the verses. And I say, okay, now I got it. Cause I never thought, I always thought you couldn't make a case for Mary, you know, uh, anyway. And I, how they can use the, uh, about the Eucharist, you know, they, oh, you can definitely make a case for the Eucharist uh, from scripture. If you choose to come to the conclusions that they have, which I do not. Uh, so I just find it easy than trying to make somebody a preterist. Just ask them, you know, those questions that I, you know, mentioned, I, I'm in a real fog today because I, I came down with something over the weekend. And I'll tell you, this mental fog is uh, unbelievable. Um, on top of my age, you know, <laughs> it's just, it's really something else. A good, a GoFundMe would be, would be a good idea, Mike. Um, <laughs> anyhow, I appreciated your efforts, but I was disappointed because you weren't really able to make any good points, in my opinion, that would have been helpful to anybody in that in that you know in that uh, forum and you've got so many good points to make uh and so much good teaching to deliver so we kind of have to be more wiser and i think in how we go about it uh, more precise in narrowing people down you know i'm just i'm not trying to make you a better it's just you know does this say that it mm -hmm. says you know all this will be fulfilled and they're talking about 70 ad right so okay that's all I'm, all right so you can see that the case can be made. All right, so now we can move on. And it just becomes a lot less controversial and combative. And, uh, and then you just move on. Because I believe that a seed planted 
is a sprout down the road. And uh, that's all I have to say. Thanks. Yeah, Richard, I, I, I really appreciate your, uh, you know, I appreciate the nice comments you made, of course, encouraging, and I appreciate you tuning into the uh, dialogue there. And, and I share a lot of uh, very similar thoughts as you. Uh, I do want to appreciate something you said that I wrote down was, uh, how can a case be made from scripture and, and in regards to anything? Because as you're rightly pointing out, uh, one of the things is that we, uh, we fail to properly frame what it is that we're going to talk about, you know, so rather than saying like, here we are doing a debate on preterism, or here we are doing a debate on whatever doctrine, rather than doing that, a, a great approach, and again, I would say by and large, in most of my life, I live like that, where it's, let me at least present this, and let me hear how you could present it, uh, giving validity to people having something to present, and then usually from there, it's, you know, okay, so does that work, or is that the view of these people? Like, what you're rightly pointing out is that there could be a, a case could be made from the seven day Adventist that the mark of the beast is Sunday worship from the scriptures. Now, is that what the scriptures actually teach? Is that what the people who are writing the scriptures were actually intending to teach? Uh, so what we need to do is properly frame uh, our studies. Like I thought you, you explained it very well, where, you know, uh, let's talk about the Great Commission. You know, let's look at scriptures about the Great Commission. Let's learn what it is. Let's see if these crazy preterists, quote unquote, uh, where they say that the Great Commission was fulfilled in the first century. Is there anything in the Bible that would even allude to that? Let's study it out. And, and you rightly said it, uh, Richard, that, you know, that's the way that we should be going about our dialogue and our discussions. Uh, you know, if I may, again, just remind us, I wasn't prepared for it to be a debate. I was prepared for me to sort of be interviewed. You know, I thought, and uh, Zach, I think everybody that was watching it, I know, I was kind of thinking the same thing, like, what is going on here? You know, uh, I thought that I was going to be brought on the program. We might, I didn't know how we were going to get into it. I knew we were going to get into it, of course, but I didn't know from what framework we were really going to operate. So when it went all around to the messianic ministry, to, you know, to the fulfillment of the law, what fulfillment means to biblical cosmology, it was a lot. It was. And Richard, I'm glad that my uh, facial expressions speak well. Uh, you know, my confusion was there. I wasn't so much confused about the topics. I was just, as you, you said it very well, you like read my mind. Uh, you know, I was, I was thinking, how do I, you know, I know there's people watching this that are looking for something, you know, of substance here. And how do I bring this back to what we're supposed to be talking about? And uh, that was a lot of uh, a lot of the discussion. That's not to say that the things that he was bringing up don't need to be properly broken down. Like what I'm going to do is I'm going to preface tomorrow's program with exactly what Richard had just said. What we're going to do is we're going to read these texts and we're going to say, you know, can a case be made from Scripture regarding preterism? You know, can a case be made when you look at uh, Matthew chapter five, verses 17 through 20, what I'm telling you about the fulfillment of the law in the first century, the heaven and the earth being fulfilled, can a case be made from scripture? Why do why does Mike Miano believe these crazy things? Or am I just, you know, sort of pulling things out of the air and defining things according to my own understanding? That's the question we need to ask. So yeah, you know, we're going to do that, man. We're going to really lean in. And again, uh, you know, we need to mark out the topics. Like I have, uh, just to wet your senses here, uh, I have... Um, the law to be established from Zion. Obviously, we have to lean in on that topic a bit. Uh, what did what did it mean prophetically that the law was going to be established in Zion? And I did want to let you know, direct, almost a direct quote. It's almost a, a little bit of a paraphrase. Sean Griffin says at moment 2521, if you go back into the discussion, I missed this. And there was quite a few things. I'm, I'm trying to remember. I'm trying to get back to a thought when Zach was sharing. He had said something that reminded me that, uh, you know, when we got in on this discussion, there were a couple of things that I just wasn't, uh, it's skipping my mind. Either way, uh, we'll talk about the, this, what it meant to, for the law to be established from Zion. You know, that was something that I think needs to be understood. Sean Griffin at 2521 in that dialogue said, you do not come into the new covenant until you have new bodies. Okay, so that, that's a big issue that we need to deal with right there. Uh, you know, and then obviously biblical cosmology. We need to talk about the tabernacle of God. Uh, again, I mentioned he has a video on his website, uh, Kingdom in Context, where he's explaining his view. I'm going to watch that. I want to understand why it is he believes these literal things and how he's interpreting these things. So we'll do that and more uh, in the days to come here on the Preterist Power Hour. Uh, Edward, I'm going to give you a moment here to close out. And since I opened in prayer, I'll let you close. Uh, but before we do that, I just want to mention a couple resources that I'm going to post on our uh, blog site at powerofpreterism.wordpress.com. Obviously, I'll share a link to his teaching on has the day of the Lord already occurred. 
I'll also go ahead and uh, put a bonus one in there. I'll share the link to his teaching on has the resurrection of the dead already occurred. I have to go ahead and watch that myself. Uh, and then I'll also include a link from him. So he's getting a bunch of a uh, free promo from our website. Uh, we'll provide the link of uh, the talk that I had uh, with him. So we'll, we'll give you, I'm sorry, we'll do the talk I had with him, the teaching he had on the coming of the Lord and the link to the tabernacle that I referenced before uh, that he has on his website. Now, uh, I also want to share, since we talked about Matthew chapter five, I'd like to share a, a teaching I had done at the Preterist Pilgrim Weekend uh, years ago in regards to that text. We did a teaching on uh, why the last days are in our past, and the text I was assigned uh, was Matthew chapter five, and I was able to give that teaching. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, provide a link to that for people to go ahead and be edified by. Uh, I might share a link. I think I have a concise link to my views of Genesis. Uh, you know, many of you know I, I hold to covenant creation, and uh, that's, a, that's a very broad phrase because there's people within covenant creation that don't necessarily agree with each other. It's kind of like preterist. You know, there's people that don't agree with each other. So I'll go ahead and share my link in that regard. And another link that I'm going to share, I'm going to look it up and find one. One of the ones that I feel is most beneficial is a link to Don Preston's resources on Torah to tell us. Reason being, there was a lot of talk about the Torah and the law uh, during that discussion. And I believe that if some of those people watching that uh, program that adhere maybe to that view that was being shared by Sean, uh, maybe they need to lean in on some of Dr. Don K. Preston's resources about the fulfillment of the law. And uh, Don has continued to labor in that regard, and I've been blessed by his resources. So I'll find something that I felt was of most worthy note and share that link as well. So uh, that's me, Edward. I pray that uh, everybody was edified. I thank those of you. Thank Richard and Zach for being here live with us. I thank those of you that are viewing through social media uh, live with us. And of course, those of you that may view uh, at a later date, join us again tomorrow at 11 a.m. Edward, I'm going to pass it over to you. Okay, before I close us in prayer, I just wanted to give some encouraging words to Richard um, uh, about he, he not wanting to debate people that are way off and have no clue of preterism. Um, I, I, I would hope that he would consider, you know, in rejecting an individual to debate or have a dialogue with to consider their followers and their audience because their followers and audience may need to hear clarity and truth, you know, instead of the falsehood that the individual may be presenting to them and following. You know, so just to consider the audience and the followers, you know, because that might encourage you to feel that you, it might be necessary to give clarity to those people. Now, let us close, let, I'll close in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time that we have had, that we've come to understand that uh, we need uh, cases, need, is, is a possibility to make a case out of the topic in which is being discussed. You know, this is what we have come to conclude, and hopefully um, we will follow this premise, and hopefully clarity will be uh, granted. Uh, thank you for this time. Hopefully people were edified and uh, given clarity to the discussion that was made, and uh, God bless everyone. Give uh, grant health, strength, uh, vitality, and for those that are ill, uh, stressed, going through this pandemic of being locked down, wearing masks, social distancing, all of these things, uh, family members that are dealing with uh, addictions, uh, for those for those that are suffering addiction and the family members that are affected by it, give them strength uh, and, uh, and, and, and the diligence to go through whatever process is necessary in Jesus name. Amen. 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 Thank you, brother. Uh, again, tomorrow morning, 11 a.m., uh, you can join us for Preterist Power Hour or Preterist Power Hour and a Half. Uh, thank you uh, again, all of you for being here with us this morning. Uh, Zach, I'll continue to pray for your family and Richard, continue to pray for you. And of course, praising God for both of you being here with us. Go in peace. Amen. God bless. God bless you, brother.